Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BBL Emerging International Law Voices Series. Tonight we have the pleasure to bridge between practice and academia. As we know many times, there are voices that claim that international law is only theory, that international law maybe does not apply. And on this, we have the pleasure and the honor to host tonight Lucia Breskova. Lucia Breskova from the Guernica 37 Chambers, who is here in order to speak with us about all these issues and much more. Lucia, welcome officially to the BUL School of Law. And uh, with this, uh, we have to ask you about your interesting route so far. You have uh, a route also in the European Court of Justice and also in the European Court of Human Rights. But before that, you enter the practical sphere through a very interesting PhD that you actually conducted in the Oxford Books University. Would you like to tell us a bit first about your academic steps and then about your practical career? So, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here and for a very warm welcome. Uh, so to start with, I have um, started my studies uh, at uh, Oxford Brookes University. Uh, I have done my undergraduate law degree there. Uh, during my studies, I was very lucky to meet my, two of my future PhD supervisors, uh, Professor Morano Fodi and Professor Stelios Andradakis, who has transferred from Oxford Brookes and is currently here at the Bruno exactly. uh, University. Exactly, we're lucky to have him here in the Beagle School of Law. I was lucky to have him as a PhD supervisor, and now uh, your students are uh, having the same luck, I'm sure. Um, so having done my uh, undergraduate degree, I was thinking what else I wanted to do. Uh, up, up on my mind was improving my French, so I decided to do master's degree uh, in Lyon at Jean Moulin University. Uh, after I came back um, to the UK, uh, to Oxford, I became a paralegal in a law firm. So I was uh, working uh, in Crown Court with, alongside barristers preparing trials. I was uh, also representing persons in a police station during police interviews. Um, although I was not qualified lawyer, I could do that because I obtained a separate qualification. And whilst I was uh, working as a paralegal, um, I was um, um, introduced to this opportunity to apply for um, scholarship and for PhD at Oxford Brookes University. You see, so far you have told us very interesting things. First of all, for me it's very interesting the fact that you chose France to go. This is because of continental Europe, continental law. How did you choose France to be your first stop of the LLM studies? So um, LLM the course, first of all, because that was a combination of international law and EU law. So not just one or the other, but it was a, a combination of both. And secondly, I, I wanted to improve my French. And I have lived in the UK by that point for good five years. So I wanted to just uh, change scenery. And Lyon is a beautiful city, so why not? Indeed, it is a beautiful city, which brings me to the question, whether EU law and international law can be married, can be wedded, do you think that because there are different jurisdictions and many people tend to think that they're separate also fields of study, but do you think there is an intersection between them? Uh, yes, of course, uh, there is um, a relationship between international and uh, EU law. Um, uh, for example, well, e we know that EU is a, is a specific international organization, uh, is not the typical ordinary international organization like United Nations, for example. Or supranational? Well, uh, yes, exactly. It was born as an international organization, and then it changed to something which we now call supranational. So it's something more than ordinary international organization. It's very much sui generis, it's uh, constitutionalized. Uh, a lot, but it's not a state. So uh, I on the spectrum is somewhere in between, and this is why the uniqueness of uh, EU as an organization and as EU law comes from. And this, the, the relationship between EU law and international law is very interesting one as well. Because we have also the non-state actors in international law. And this brings me also to your PhD studies and corporations. I think in between all this discussion, also corporations enter again as not legally subjects of international law. Yes. At the same time, we know, ladies and gentlemen, that the discussion in international law about the human rights of corporations is very much increasing. So in this ambience, Lucia, comes also your PhD about migrants. Yes. If I'm not wrong, yes. would you like to tell us a bit more about your PhD? Yes, so basically my PhD concentrated on intersection of EU law, international law, human rights, and migration and integration. 
uh, and I, I was looking specifically at treatment of uh, one group of migrant workers. They, uh, they are highly skilled migrant workers called intracompany transferees. There is usually this assumption that because you are a highly skilled migrant worker, you are treated very well. Uh, and uh, your human rights are protected, you are safe because you are wanted. Uh, I I countries are interested in um, retaining this workforce. Uh, but what I found in my PhD, and I was comparing law and policy in two countries, in my own country, Slovakia, and in England, uh, in the UK, uh, I found that it is not entirely so. And uh, especially in, in Slovakia, I found that uh, sometimes, if especially employers, had to bypass the law uh, in order to avoid the, um, the bureaucracy to be able to actually employ these migrants. So it is not uh, as... It brings me, I think, to the difference that sometimes exists between the theory and practice of yes. law. And something now you experience very acutely being a barrister in Guernica 37 Chambers. How did this come into your life? What is your natural choice already from the PhD studies or did it come eventually after your experience in the European Court of Justice? So uh, as, as part of my PhD studies, I, always, I was always a practitioner and academic at the same time. So I wanted to combine the two, so I thought my PhD will be very uh, practical. So that's why I did uh, these various internships and jobs either in uh, Luxembourg or Strasbourg. Uh, I, I d conducted my PhD um, studies and research there and uh, I was able to work and benefit from the resources and the employees including judges of these two courts. So having done my PhD I I felt that I have developed and established expertise in for example international and human rights um, which I could then employ in becoming a barrister. So I applied for pupillage, and I think my PhD was actually helpful in uh, securing a pupillage because I came, uh, I, when I was applying for pupillage, I was a little bit older. I have done all these amazing things. I have had these experiences and achieved a PhD degree as well. So I, I was sort of maybe a distinctive candidate from um, other candidates, true, and, and I, I, have, uh, I was very lucky to secure a pupillage, so a barrister training uh, in a London leading set of chambers. Uh, that was in criminal law. But then I always had the interest to practice in international law, and this is why I'm uh, at Guernica 37 chambers. And this is why you are here also tonight <laughs> with us, because of international law's expertise. And what is unique when it comes to the Guernica 37 chambers, and you chose it? So it's. Um, the, 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 the persons who established uh, our set of chambers, uh, Toby Kadman and Albon de Dambernabu, co-head of, of chambers, had this vision to create an organization that would be victims oriented. And in traditional chamber setting, that was not possible. So they went on their own. They ventured into this uh, new structure that uh, combines chambers, but also we have an NGO, uh, which is um, established uh, in the U.S. as an NGO organization. So we, we um, benefit from both the NGO and the chambers, uh, and we are very much helping each other uh, and work together uh, in to make sure that those who are committing international crimes uh, are put to justice. And I'm going to come now to this point of yours that you mentioned about uh, international accountability in the criminal field. But before that, you talked about the NGOs. How much do you think NGOs can help the quest of international justice? Uh, I think they, uh, they are very important in this quest because, for example, NGOs uh, like Human Rights Watch um, are often the ones who are um, documenting uh, international crimes or uh, human rights violations. So alongside the official formal uh, investigators, prosecutors, they can very much help uh, in this field by uh, going to places and document uh, and actually collect evidence and speak to those who are on the ground who experience um, these human rights violations or are victims uh, of international crimes. Especially when it comes to digital evidence, but not only this. So you actually dealt with the cases that have to do with evidence uh, before the special chambers of Kosovo. What is your experience with this? Meaning, what do you think of the hurdles? when we speak about assessing evidence, evaluating evidence, what do international courts have to face when it comes to evidence? So basically pretty much what um, domestic criminal courts have to, have to face. Uh, so what is important uh, to however realize is that um, documenting and investigating uh, international crimes can be much more complex. 
but um, the same rules apply. Uh, the rules, uh, for example, of ensuring continuity of evidence. And what I mean by that is you have to have a paper, paper trail. So from the point when you, for example, find a piece of evidence, like a bullet fragment uh, in a field where uh, fighting has happened, uh, when you find that bullet fragment, the person that collects that fragment has to catalog it, um, in a correct way, uh, has to assign a special, we call it exhibit number, uh, has to provide a statement how that uh, an exhibit was collected, and when f uh, then this piece of evidence is sent for forensic examination, again, there has to be witness statement from the expert who received that evidence, um, and stuff like that. So we have to ensure uh, to be able to rely on this piece of evidence at trial in the future, uh, there has to be continuity of evidence. Otherwise, the defense uh, could argue that such evidence is not admissible. Exactly. And it's very important also for the students, for the young law researchers that are listening to us tonight, to actually underline that, as Lucia says now, evidence and the procedures in the international field and the domestic field can be very much alike. Some people are a bit more intrigued or sometimes afraid about the international procedure, but things can be simple also there. Because you have also the experience, the extensive experience in the domestic field also, with domestic cases. Yes. So do you think any other changes, any other resemblances or differences between international law profile cases or domestic law? Um, well, of course, international law cases, they, they are very complex. Uh, they are not easy to prosecute for various reasons. And we could uh, be here for another interview just to talk about that. So, for example, heads of state have immunity. Uh, um, many, there are many international courts or uh, ad hoc tribunals or other hybrid tribunals that may not have the jurisdiction for various reasons. Um, so it is... I guess easier to prosecute or, or, or to have a domestic trial. Can I ask you here a policy yes. question, if you can answer the question, because <laughs> of course we see a gentleman is an active barrister we said she has also cases before courts running now, so also there are some uh, hurdles and obstacles regarding the commission and the messages we can impart. But if you can uh, tell us uh, your opinion, whether you think that the different courts, international courts that exist now, do they undermine or do they enforce the existence of the International Court of Justice, or the International Criminal Court? Um, so International Criminal Court um, has its uh, positives and negatives. Like for example, not all the international, not, sorry, not all the uh, countries in the world are signatories to the Rome Statute, so uh, the court doesn't have uh, jurisdiction uh, over them. Um, therefore, sometimes uh, in different situations, people think about creating different avenues to get justice and uh, to make sure that impunity uh, doesn't exist. Um, so, for example, we can have different hybrid tribunals, which can be useful, which can sort of complement uh, the situations where international criminal court uh, is, um, cannot uh, deal with the case. Um, they, so I think they have a role to play. They have a positive role to play, but again, there are so many of them, and they, sometimes they can be very specific uh, to a given situation. Um, so in that regard, they can sort of undermine the universal universality of international law, which is basically the aim, because they are applied to a specific context in a specific uh, jurisdiction uh, using domestic law, uh, which can be or just obviously different in different countries. So they can be helpful, but they also have these advantages. And as you said before, maybe because the chambers have the local judges, maybe they give also the local flavor and they create more trust also to the local people. Yes, which is the advantage exactly. But then on the other side, because of the locality and because of the specificity that can undermine uh, the, the, the universality of international law, which is what we are trying to achieve. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You're absolutely right. And you speak about universal jurisdiction. You mentioned it. And uh, we know that we had here in the UK the Pinochet case and other cases all over the world. Uh, I know that you work also with universal jurisdiction. How much of an advocate are you for the universal jurisdiction? How do you think? Uh, should there have been any constraints? Uh, should it be unfettered? What's your opinion about universal jurisdiction? I mean, looking at the concept of universal jurisdiction uh, is there, and it's usually used when there are no other avenues. Um, basically, it, it simply means any crime can be investigated, uh, so prosecuted or investigated uh, in any country applying this um, concept, regardless of who the perpetrator or victim is or where the crime was committed. Um, 
most of the country, most of the members of the United Nations do have this concept in their national jurisdiction in one way or other. However, the countries for primarily political reasons tend to limit uh, the, the, this concept in a number of ways. Like, for example, they will limit it to only certain crimes or they will uh, limit, it, limit the status of perpetrator or the complainant. So then only certain people can be brought to justice. And the, of course, then you have concepts of the immunity of heads of state. So uh, in my view, I would like to see more cases. Uh, being brought under the, um, the, this concept of universal jurisdiction. And you have also the involvement in the case of Yemen. Uh, what got you there? So uh, the case of Yemen was actually, I was glad to be involved in this case because obviously we have different situations around the world and some situations, and I will not name, but everyone can uh, uh, have an example in mind, uh, attract more attention than others. So my involvement in Yemen is uh, there is ongoing conflict for a very long time. A lot of people's, people are suffering human rights violations and uh, suffering war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, so, so the idea was to, to try to pursue the International Criminal Court and the British prosecutor uh, to, to look into or investigate these crimes. Um, so we submitted as chambers brief to International Criminal Court to pursue that the court has a jurisdiction over crime of forcible um, deportation because the crime has um, cross-border element. So State of Yemen is not um, signatory to the Rome Statute, uh, but some of the surrounding countries are, which means when per persons are pushed from Yemen to uh, those other countries that are members, those states uh, um, are Could also in the, also yes. the, the And, uh, and the, yeah. the International Criminal Court has, uh, through this way, uh, jurisdiction over these situations. Indeed, uh, it's very important all your work. And I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, more important, that Lucia has the ability now and the opportunity to transmit this information to students. Lucia, would you like to tell us a bit about your teaching now, how you impart this information to the students? What are the reactions of the students? Uh, are they convinced to become more barristers or more academics? How do you manage actually to impart the message of international law to students? Um, so international law obviously is there and it has uh, its proponents and also those who criticize it a lot that uh, some people think it's not really a law. But from uh, my experience, I can, I can say that there is uh, merit in having it and using it and trying to employ it as well as uh, other avenues and that's what we are trying to do in our chambers. Uh, but so from my practice and especially teaching GDL students who want to be either solicitors or barristers, I was able to draw uh, from examples from my own practice um, and, and to explain what it's like to be an academic, what it's also like a barrister. And one way doesn't, ex sorry, one doesn't exclude the other. So I, it's I very am, important what you say. Yes, I am, I am a barrister, but I also teach alongside. So as a barrister, self-employed barrister, you are more or less your own boss. So you can, you know, you can decide to do other things as well. And uh, teaching is very rewarding uh, because I feel that um, my, my practical skills as a lawyer uh, can be useful for students because they can ask me questions about what it's like in real life. <laughs> what aspects of teaching do you enjoy most? Uh, the fact that I can give back uh, to the institution that I have um, benefited a lot from, so Oxford Brookes University. I have been given amazing um, opportunities. I'm very grateful that I have um, decided to do a PhD because it was a very positive and open door and uh, uh, to amazing life experiences. Like, for example, I have um, made not only friends, but also future very important professional contacts within international courts and institutions. Um, so f f in, in that way, uh, I can tell students, don't be afraid. You know, if you can do a PhD straight away after uh, and go into academia, you can qualify, you can, uh, you know, whichever way it works for you, <laughs> you there is no specific formula how to succeed. And also basically. because many people think PhD is only for those who want to enter academia. Yes, no. Definitely. But exactly, you have worked also in the European Court of Human Rights. So from your experience, how much is the PhD appreciated also in the practice? Um, so there is this general perception that at, at the Bar of England and was, if you have a PhD, 
uh, a year or two academic, but I actually uh, found the opposite. So this is what I was told, that how I will be viewed if, if I have a PhD, but uh, I think it has been only positive for me, not only uh, in my practice in international, because I have gained the expertise that I needed, uh, but also um, just being slightly different to other candidates when I applied for pupillage. Um, so yeah, I, I think it has been a very positive to do, to do it first. Um, it, I, it w I was just in the right time, in the right place. <laughs> it's very important, as you say correctly. I see also from your work so far that between international law and the EU law, international law seems to actually capture your heart when it comes to the work, to the policy choices that you undertake. How do you see yourself being a, actually an international law person, or eventually you think EU law uh, has not finished for you? Uh, I think um, we obviously we use uh, EU courts as well, so uh, I, I can't say which way I will go. It, it really international law and the cases that we are dealing with is really case by case. So sometimes I do a little bit more human rights, sometimes I, I do a little bit of extradition, then the next day I may have e EU law case, I might be dealing with cases to do with um, um, business and human rights or arbitration. So you know we are, we are doing different aspects of international law, so I see myself uh, having a wide practice when it comes to international law, and by that I'm, I include EU law in that because EU Which law is very important. I don't know if EU law is you're going to agree with you necessarily that EU law is part of international law. I personally I can't can agree with international lawyer, but uh, <laughs> it's important the first thing that you give. Yes. And the last question, Lucia, what piece of advice would you give to young people who want to engage with international law, who want maybe to become barristers, academics? How should they approach law, the legal studies? Um, so it is, this is a very interesting question because uh, it really depends on the individual route because you can have someone who does LLB, then they, then they do LLM, um, and the, either bar course or the solicitor's qualification. But then you have other students who wish to perhaps uh, do a law degree in something else, then they transfer, do a master's degree, and maybe even PhD, and then bar course uh, or um, solicitor's exams. Uh, so it is very difficult to give sort of a um, general answer that would probably give some sort of path to different type of uh, student. For example, is the pupillage stage important for the determination afterwards of the chambers? How important is the pupillage? How important is the university sometimes? Where should the students put some gravity when they come to uh, actually map their careers? Uh, so, in just I would, I would probably go for some LLM studies and uh, uh, to, to see whether, if you are undecided, you know, do an LLM, give yourself the time to think because LLM might persuade you to go the academic path exactly. and then doing a PhD uh, or it may actually dissuade You're you. You're right here because LLM exposes to new fields of law, yes. to new ideas, new professors. Yes. So it, if you are undecided, I would do something that would give me time to think about it and, and maybe decide at the end of whatever that might be. But what is important is also, uh, if, if you are, for example, leaning on the academic side, do an internship in an international organization or an NGO just to see what it's like uh, to practice uh, law or apply it uh, in, in, in life, just to give you a different perspective. And that may sway you one way or the other. Thank you very much, Lucia, for the interesting insights. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Lucia Brieskova with us tonight. We bid you farewell and uh, we renew our meeting till the next episode of the BUL Emerging International Law Voices. I'm Dr. Solon Solomon, lecturer here in the BUL School of Law and co-director of the BUL International Law Group. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>